This is Coons Ford Turf Talk. Call 410-481-1300 now. Once again, here's Bruce Posner. All right, back here on segment three, and it's been a little while since I had him on the show, but he's always my friend, always a great goalie for the University of Maryland. And last year, the MLL Co-Goalie of the Year, quite an honor. That's also the coach of Immaculata College, and that's my good buddy, Nico Amato. Nico, welcome in, my friend. How's it going? Thanks for having me. Always, always a pleasure. So uh, before we talk about your contract and all this, all that stuff, how have you transitioned into being a head coach? I know you had some experience beforehand, but how much how much do you love it? Uh, yeah, it's definitely a lot more responsibility, probably a little bit more than I uh, realized going into it. But it's, it's pretty cool to be kind of the top of the uh, program and kind of have the final say on some decisions and – it's been challenging in new ways now, kind of grooming other coaches to take some responsibilities off my plate and having the trust for them to do that. And then shifting gears, this is really my first chance I ever had to like really coach an offense. So <clears throat> as a goalie, you know, you, you're really a defensive-minded player, but you have to kind of know what works and what doesn't coming at you. So it's been pretty cool to broaden my horizons as a coach and kind of try out some new things. And uh, I think this year... We're starting to make some strides collectively as a team, and I think we'll have a more successful campaign this year than last. Nico, how proud of you that you continued the goalie tradition when you took over from Phipps, and then you had your term, and you led to Burn Lohr, who was All-American, and then to Danny Mars, who was All-American. What? Tell me about that, because you, for three years, you were the guy. There's no doubt. Your accolades were unbelievable. But how proud of you were the guys who followed yeah, it's been pretty cool. Uh, I mean, Maryland's always had a strong history of uh, goalies, so you can really go back to the record books and, you know, look at, you know, 10 or 20 that were phenomenal. And it starts with guys um, throughout the 70s, probably even earlier than that. But um, just recently from Phipps onward, it's been pretty strong. And I think, you know, all of us have a good relationship and it's pretty cool now that we all get the chance to play against one another and, uh, I'm sure Danny Morris is now going to jump into the league and be, do well. And I think this year will be the first year um, in a little bit that the goalie position has been up for grabs again at Maryland. So it should be interesting to see who kind of takes that spot. Nico, before we get into talk about your new contract and everything in the MLL, uh, tell everybody, did, did the does the shot clock come down to D3 as well as to D1? Yes, it does. Um that's a good question. I had to look it up myself. But, uh, yeah, there's going to be an 80-second shot clock, so you figure you got 20 seconds to clear, and then you're looking to play offense, you know, for 60 seconds, which is pretty similar to the MLL structure right now. Um, you know, the athletes in the MLL get 60 seconds from the time you possess it, so you have 20 seconds to clear. But I think the, the additional 20 is definitely needed for um, college. Uh, I'm not one – that really was a big proponent of the shot clock. Now that it's here, I'm not going to complain about it or, you know, I don't think it's going to hurt the game that much, but I do think, you know, college lacrosse needs to relax with being tampered with all that much and just let the players play. Yeah, it's a great game without it. I had my doubts too, but I know one thing where you got the advantage and that is being a goalie, you understand even now how more important the clear is with the shot clock. Because you really need that shot. You know, you're going to do the best in the early part of the shot clock, I would think. Yeah, I mean, anytime you have more time to attack, you're going to be able to cycle the ball more and you're going to have more chances to uh, catch someone napping on defense, I think. That was one of the things that I adjusted with uh, my first few years in the MLL. I didn't really have a lot of game experience. But in practice, you know, Coach Cottle and the other coaches were – placing a heavy emphasis on getting the ball up and out quick and getting the balls to the athletes quick so they can run it over the midline and give our offense, you know, as much time as possible to score a goal. Because, you know, in that league, everyone's so talented. You really need the guys to click for as long as possible in order to earn a goal. Well, you had Connell coaching you, and then you had John Tillman coaching you. Which style have you copied more between the two? Uh, I definitely take things from both. Um, I think... Coach Cottle is, you know, very brilliant with his X's and O's as an offensive guy. 
Um, so I, I definitely take a lot of plays and, you know, being a little bit personable with the players in that regard from Coach Cottle. And I probably, uh, I'm a little tougher on players like Coach Cottle in terms of being direct and, you know, maybe dropping some curses, but, curse words. But uh, <laughs> some of the things I really admire from Coach Tillman is like his organization, his dedication, and uh, attention to detail. Um, he's one of those guys that holds his players accountable number one through number 50 or whoever's at the end of the uh, end of the ranks. And, you know, he's one of those guys that sees the whole field very well. He's mastered the clear, the riding, all the small things that make, you know, a team go from good to great. So um, I try to do my best with that. But, I mean, I honestly think he's one of the best coaches out in the game right now. So, you know, to to learn anything from him is definitely something I'm trying to do. All right, so you got you got locked up into a three year deal with the uh, uh, Chesapeake Bayhawks. I know you got to be happy about that. And then the rumor comes out about the new league with Paul Rabel. Did you do, were you aware of that when you signed the contract? Was that a rumor, or where where did that enter into your mindset of signing the deal? Yeah, so I think right around there was like whispers of it going on during the summer. And, you know, I was just trying to really tune that out because, you know, in the summer you're trying to compete and win win a championship. And then I heard about it a little bit before um, it went public. And for me, I just saw I kind of weighed both options. And, you know, I've been with the Bayhawks since 2015, uh, 2014 winter. And, you know, the familiarity I have with the program the familiarity I have with Coach Cottle, you know, I really respect him, and I think our team is pretty close knit. And I think you're going to see a lot of the guys stick together on the Bayhawks and try to make a run at a championship. I personally think the MO is a great organization, and I think that you know, over the next few years, you're going to see it improve. I've already seen some improvements since my time in the league, and um, you know, our owner, B. Brendan Kelly, he, he's not afraid of the competition, and you know, if there's another league that pops up, so be it. But we're going to focus on us and handle our business in the MLL. Well, it's a good thing. The more that look, there's a lot of lacrosse players out there. I mean, I know you're the considered one of the best goalies in the MLL, but there's a lot of goalies out there who couldn't even make a roster that are good goalies. So it's not like the talent's not out there, and uh, it's only good for lacrosse in my eyes. But the smartest thing they did was finally starting the season after Memorial Day. I just thought it was so ridiculous to start the season early because of the competition with college. Yeah, it's it's one of those things that made the league a little interesting in terms of it put a little bit more stress on the general managers and the coaches to, you know, communicate and find some players from the player pool and the supplemental draft and, you know, orchestrate your roster for the early season. And it did make things interesting because it, it always felt like there was a beginning – a middle and end to the season now. Um, every play, it's going to be a lot more competitive. So you might not see some of the supplemental guys or um, some of the older veterans as much, especially if they're trying to inject some younger talent into the league. Um, but I think overall, it is going to get a, give the fans a chance to transition from okay, hey, we're coming off the college season. You're going to see all the Memorial Day stuff. You're going to see all the champions, the tour ends. And then you're going to see these young guys go right into the draft and then get on a professional team. And I think we're going to earn some more fans through that because they're going to be, you know, following their favorite players or favorite team members and see where they go next. And I think that's something that has kind of gotten lost in the shuffle in years past. As a coach, Nico, I mean, you're certainly was one of the top players in the country, All-American three years, and then now the MVP and the uh, goal, co-MVP as a goalie. How tough is it for you to, like, you know, you're in a D3 level, so your players are not, I would assume they're not at that top, top level of talent. How tough is that for you to adjust to that, you know, not having a Rambo there or not having the tremendous talent you had at Maryland or Lyle Thompson at the, in the MLL? How tough is that? Yeah, it's definitely a learning curve. I mean, I love the players I have. I've been given. I chose them. They didn't really choose me. Um, I do have some freshmen that I did recruit, but, um, you know, you'd be surprised with 
the talent they have, but at the same time, you know, th- these guys are, are at Immaculata and Division Three guys are at, at D3 locations for a reason. And, you know, I think I'm still honing my coaching skills. So it's a learning curve and a learning process for all of us. And realistically, we're just looking for constant improvement and growth on a day-to-day basis. And it's really cool to be, you know, playing at a high level and being able to pick the brains of, you know, awesome players, awesome coaches, and then use the film, use some of the other tools I've gotten from Maryland and and the Bayhawks to kind of pass down to these guys. Um, You know, the majority of my guys didn't really start playing until they were later or they're kind of diamonds in the rough from some lesser known programs. So there's some talent, but we definitely have our work cut out for us. Yeah, there's no doubt. But uh, I know from watching, I live about one minute from Stevenson. And I watch, I might go to three or four Stevenson games during the year. And sometimes I look at the town out there and it's it's a very fine line of the difference all right, in ability. And you've seen that in the MLL because you've had some D3 players make it in the MLL. Yeah, so I think the biggest thing is Division One, you know, you're really putting in a lot more hours physically and um, in the what I call the lacrosse classroom, so the film room. I don't think you get that as much at the Division Three level um, with the rules and and the coaching. But you know, most of the things that I think separate a Division One All American versus a Division Two or Three All American is kind of from the neck up, or you know, it's more cerebral, or it's a little bit of hey, can you do this on the move a little bit better than that guy? Or do you have a, a skill set that sticks out? So it's, it, you're right, it is a fine line. Well, anyway, congratulations to you on signing the three-year deal. It's got to give you some security along with IDA. I know he did and uh, a bunch of other Terps on uh, on the Bayhawks and uh, some non-Terps too. And uh how do you feel about playing with the Hopkins guys? Is it like is it like still a little thing there, or is that just during when they play each other? Um, for me, I think it's definitely more intense when you're playing in college. <laughs> I'm not sure we have any Hopkins guys on our roster right now that I can think of off the top of my head. But um, you know, at this point in my career, and I think the majority of the people that are still playing, you know, they're chasing championships and 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 always ultimately putting the team first so um you know we don't do this for millions of dollars yet but at the end of the day the pride factor and you know what we play for is very important so for me at the end of the day i want to make the best memories possible at this next level and try to compete and bring my best every day to help the team win the championship last question you still talk to doc a lot yeah, I still run into him. Uh, believe it or not, we're we're actually neighbors back home in Philly. So he's about a, a two minute walk from my house, and um, I don't get the chance to see him on an everyday basis like I did when I worked for him out after college. But you know, we work a few camps together throughout the year. Usually, one in the fall, one in the winter, and one in the summer. So um, we definitely get to pick each other's brains and have a little friendly competition, especially as him being a assistant coach for the Wizards, too. Well, it might take a few years, but I'm sure, I'm sure you'll join him in Maryland Hall of Fame one day. And, uh, Nico, thanks a lot for coming on, and uh, we wish you the best, and congratulations on your signing of the contract, and have a great season this year. I'm going to do my best to get out to see Immaculata one game this year for sure. Awesome. Sounds good. Thank you for having me. All right. Good to talk to you, Nico.